This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. What, what do we know? Okay, you may be wondering what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year, Jay. How about you looking know. at the other people and look and see if they're wondering. They want, they're not wondering. They know what we're doing here. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> 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 and quite love. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't come until February. But <clears throat> anyway, this is, uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii. And of course, Wednesday at 4 o'clock is Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which was organized originally <laughs> by Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and co-host of this show. Welcome, Sharon. Aloha. Why don't you do a little uh, introduction of Chip Fletcher? Okay, Chip Fletcher, Dr. Fletcher, is the Associate Dean at the UH uh, School of Ocean, Earth Sciences, and Technology. Technology. Yep. Long name. Uh, but they do a lot. And his area of expertise is, is really something that we all should be concerned about and happy that he's doing the work. It's on climate change, on sustainability, on the coastline, and he has very good data on, on the impacts of disasters and what all hazards <laughs> impacting on the environment. <laughs> and, uh, he, and we're really pleased that he's taken this on and is actually a scientific advocate. And we don't usually have those science advocates that, that can tell us that climate change really does exist and we really need to plan forward for it. Yeah. So I'm so pleased that we have them not only today, but also to talk to the legislators on January 10th. January 10th. What, what, what is that? What is Thank that? Thank you. Could you tell the people what is oh, happening on January 10th? January 10th is the, the forum's briefing uh, to the legislature on significant issues. Usually it's on energy. This year, because of all of the um, need for good plans, because we can't do things just willy-nilly, we have to really have good You probably plans. named that program Making... Good making plans good plans I think for a sustainable and resilient, resilient Hawaii. Hawaii. What a good That's name, right. yeah. Right. And it will be an exciting program, and it will be one of the keynoters on the panel yeah. uh, will be Dr. Fletcher. Yeah. So today we're going to discuss all. your slice of it, Chip. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, your slice is different, in, in my view, because when we talk about you know, making Hawaii sustainable, making it resilient, those are, relatively speaking, they're intermediate or even long-term goals you know, and it's plans that take a while to develop uh, to the extent they don't exist already. Um, but in, in this case, um, uh, you know, in the case of climate change, sea level rise, that's, that's pretty fast, maybe not so fast as, as weather mm -hmm. and, and weather related uh, disasters. Um, that's really what we want to talk about today because that is by definition emergent. That is the short term worrisome possibility that exists out there. That's right, extreme weather. Yeah, extreme yeah. weather. As the atmosphere gets warmer, it holds more water vapor. Um, this does two things. It creates uh, more drought, mm -hmm. and it also uh, creates heavier rainfall in places. Yeah. And um, it provides more energy to storm systems. Um, the ocean is absorbing heat and CO2, and that's damaging our marine ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So here we are in the middle of the ocean, 2,500 miles from anything. Um, we have to be resilient and sustainable and independent and mm -hmm. capable of operating on our own. But before we even get to that, we have to survive. Because <laughs> all of that doesn't mean too much if you're not surviving. Yeah. So the question is, you know, how immediate is this risk, the risk of extreme weather, let's call it that. Um, and how and how and how capable are we or can we be? You know, if we really belly up to this, um, to deal with extreme weather and survive, because I think we're talking about human lives here. Yeah, we? yeah. Uh, I think we are extremely at risk to extreme weather. I think that we are currently not capable uh, to come out of it extremely well. If they were, say, a direct hit from a hurricane, but I think we have the capacity to prepare ourselves to be much more resilient. Uh, to me, the term resilience means that you can't stop a hurricane uh, or a tsunami for that matter, but uh, you can prepare yourself to come back faster uh, once the hurricane event is over. Yeah. And I see us as having huge vulnerabilities uh, in several sectors, especially uh, the electrical grid, 
we still have power lines all over the place, mm -hmm. even after Hurricane Aniki, mm -hmm. when there was a lot of discussion of hardening our power grids so that it would uh, survive a direct hit from a hurricane. It doesn't seem like we have moved very far in that direction. Uh, we're vulnerable um, with regard to food resources every day. Uh, you know, our lifeline arrives in the form of Matson and, and uh, other shipments of food. Uh, we need to increase and invest in growing our own food. Uh, so the degree that we can um, come back from a direct strike of a hurricane with electricity, hopefully to the point where it doesn't go out or um, gets brought back online extremely quickly, um, and then can feed ourselves and have the medical supplies we need. And medical supplies. Yeah. And, and, and is, do you include water? Oh, I Absolutely. Having a supply of water. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these are all risks. I mean, and if you look at worst case analysis, if we don't have medical care, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. If we don't have water, we're in trouble even sooner. If we don't have food, we're in trouble in, in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, and electricity. Uh, yeah, if we yeah. don't have electricity, yeah. that's, uh, that's almost, think about it, that's almost immediate because everything collapses. Right. It is immediate, yeah. and it, without electricity, you don't get water delivered to you, and you don't get medical supplies delivered to you. Um, and you go to the hospitals, and they're running on backup power. And if you live in um, condos, you can't get out of your right? Units. Yeah, people get stranded in the upper stranded. floors of condos because yeah. the could be fatal. elevator doesn't work right. and the, the water elderly. doesn't run. Yeah. Yeah. So compare, I, I hate to ask, worst case analysis questions, but just to get the, all on the table here, compare what could happen here um, with a storm or a heat wave or you know, some kind of natural disaster, weather-related natural disaster, and what happened in, in Puerto Rico. Well, that's the scary comparison because Puerto Rico is going to be at least a decade, maybe more, before they come back into uh, having a full, robust economy. All we have to do is look at Kauai and uh, the hit it mm -hmm. took from Hurricane Aniki in 1992. Mm -hmm. It was a decade before uh, you could travel through Kauai and not be surrounded by evidence of that hurricane, hurricane that occurred. If we get a direct hit of a hurricane in uh, Honolulu on Oahu, um, it, it, it's going to devastate all the sectors of our economy, especially tourism. Um, and for us not to prepare for that, Given especially that the climate models are predicting uh, that we will see more and stronger El Ninos, and we know that the strong El Ninos typically are accompanied by active hurricane seasons. Uh, the El Nino of 2015-2016 had a record-setting number of tropical cyclones. Uh, at one point in that summer, we were tracking three simultaneous hurricanes in the waters around Hawaii. That had never been done before in the, in the era of satellite monitoring. Um, and uh, there is uh, robust science indicating that the uh, zone of maximum winds, the zone of tropical cyclone movement in the north central Pacific where we're located is migrating towards the poles. In fact, this is happening around the planet. The uh, storm tracks are migrating towards the poles. And if you look at the uh, tracks of past tropical cyclones um, that have come out to the north central Pacific, they tend to pass south of the Big Island, so now they'll be migrating to the north. So there are lots mm -hmm. of reasons why we need to um, be a, a lot more active in terms of preparing ourselves for uh, a direct strike of a hurricane. So it, it goes in, in um, sort of groupings. Number one is the things I have to do to prepare to, to save myself, in, in my, my mm -hmm. home, my, my family, whatever. Two is uh, what the community has to do to um, save uh, com community, um, com services like mm -hmm. water and uh, sewage. We didn't mention that earlier, but that's another one yes, that can yes, really be bothersome. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and of course, rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't rebuild, then you know the economic blow is just, it's huge. And, and it could be in terms of preserving this island as a place to live, because I think Puerto Rico is really not being preserved as a place to live. Mm. People are leaving by the Carlo, yeah. Um, we, could, we could lose Hawaii. We can lose Hawaii if we can't rebuild it fast enough. We because you know, remember 9/11? The day after 9/11, the beaches were empty. Right. And they stayed empty for a week or two or three or more. Yeah. No one was traveling. No one was traveling. And if people read in the paper about how Hawaii was devastated by whatever it was, they would not come. 
and tourism would be dead as a doornail for a long time. It shows how fragile our economy is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're, we are very vulnerable to global events, to world affairs. Yeah. And you know, imagine a direct strike or a direct event here in Ho the Hawaiian Islands. Even worse. It's, it's worse. It's in Kauai was like the receiving end of, of the headquarters city. Right, mm -hmm. the headquarters city could Honolulu could support Kauai right. and send mm -hmm. you know send food whatever is necessary over there. Um, we, we heard a story about uh, what was it in Kauai? Oh, yeah. Somebody sent a ship full of um, um, with, with, from the military. From though. the military was carrying there. a ship full of supplies. Food. But the, food. 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 They wouldn't let it in because they were mad at the military. It was really silly. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's all this, uh, it's Carl Kim and, you know, the National Prepared Disaster Training right. Center and all that stuff. Yep. Um, you know, we, 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 we're not sure that we can handle all, all that and what people know what to do and all. So it's, it's not a clear, it's not a clear, it, we're not certain that we could rebuild in time to resurrect the tourist industry. Because that could be, and if that happens, I mean, aside from all the people who get sick and die as a result of the event itself, this these islands could become ghost town, mm -hmm. un, uninhabitable. Is what might happen without so, an economy. So, so not going know. so doomsday on that. I just can, wanted to put we, it on the table. Okay, yeah, right. so. okay, okay. So, so, but there is the there is something that's preventing. We can't stop it, but is there a preventive? Is that the adaptation part of it? That if we did certain things that we may not have such a serious strike and, and, and then the resilience part, you know, the aftermath, then what do we do? I mean, are there some thoughts about that? And sure. Research on that? Um, well, like I said, the electrical system needs to be hardened, if you will, is the term they use, and uh, probably want to do that in a place-based manner. Some places you would want to put the power lines underground. Other places you'd want them in vaults that sit on the ground. Other places maybe hurricane resistant uh, towers. Um, there are mm -hmm. other people mm -hmm. that know more about this than I do, mm -hmm. but you know something to harden mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. electrical grid. Um, accompanying any hurricane is storm surge. Storm surge is actually uh, the, the one element of a hurricane that is most fatal. Uh, leads to the most property damage and the, and, uh, the most fatalities. So a big wave. Big yeah, storm, storm surge is uh, where the ocean rises because of the on. Well, if you imagine a hurricane as uh, a storm that is where the winds are rotating counterclockwise, as it approaches the shoreline, the vulnerable portion of the shoreline is in the forward right quadrant of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the wind is blowing on shore. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have 100 mile an hour winds. The storm itself is moving at 10 to 15 miles an hour. So over there, the winds are mm -hmm. 110 to 115 miles per hour. And the low atmospheric pressure creates a bulge of water. The winds create a bulge of water. The waves made by the wind create what's known as sea level setup. All that runs ashore. Mm. And mm. you can get a storm surge of 10 feet in a Category 2 or Category 3 hurricane, um, taking out all of our shorefront homes that are built slab on grade, in other words, houses that sit on their foundations. So mm. a simple change in our building codes so that um, new homes and homes that are being renovated would have some freeboard underneath them mm. up on post oh, and pier. So cool. The water could run underneath. Mm. Yeah. That doesn't work. Waikiki's not built that way. Well, that, I mean, this makes sense for tsunamis. This makes sense for sea level rise. It makes sense for a whole number of hazards. Yeah. But Waikiki will take its own sort of set of tools, <laughs> Kailua, uh, YNI, every place will have its own sort of place based Kaka solution. But there are lots of tools to be applied. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do with these high rises in the condos, for example, Kaka'ako, which is underwater in your, your graphics, you know? I mean, what do you do with this concrete and glass? There's no anything underneath, and there's a high sea level to begin with. What, what can be done? Well, um, you can put the power plant up on the roof rather than down at mm. the ground level or the, you know, below ground level. Uh, you can raise the walkways around the building um, you can design for protection. Mm. Well, not for protection, so but so that you can move can when it's oh, high tide and sea around. level has, has come up through the storm drain system. Um, you can design the first floor so that, you know, 50 years from now, when that area is being flooded by high tides, 
such as we see today in Mapunapuna. Mapunapuna no, is a great natural down. laboratory for us. You can design the first floor of these buildings so that um, whatever is in there can be uh, moved up to higher floors, and the first floor simply becomes a place where okay, uh, it's floodable, a, right? Ship, you know, it accommodates uh, the water. I see dollar signs hanging all over this. Place. Very <laughs> expensive, it's very expensive. Billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, and, and we are not yet uh, requiring of the developers to build these adaptation mm, steps in. Mm, mm. And so the longer we take to make law out of these, uh, the more billions of dollars we're committing to um, development that in the future will not be sustainable, not okay. be resilient. This is really a, sort of a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> After that, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the status of the planning efforts uh, and your participation, a couple of commissions, mm -hmm. and what they have done, what they are doing, what they might do in what order to protect us. What we want them to do. Okay, we'll take a well, short break, come back yeah. for much more. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Make it a better try a little more, more than every more. Let's do what we can. Hi, I'm Ethan Elm, host of A Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Um, oh, the steps that go up. The sidewalk is actually yeah. high. Yeah. It goes up. Yeah. Are we on right now? No, not no. yet. Oh, yes, we are. We're back. <laughs> okay. We're live. Yeah. Okay. Well, just just to refresh. It's that so was, exciting, that was a Donnie. Very to, important to question. Chip. Chip asked. You know, are we on now? And we are. I want to answer that. Sharon Wiwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and co-host of this show. Chip Fletcher, the associate dean of the SOAS uh, at the University of Hawaii Manoa. The School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. And technology. Very good. Yeah. And we are talking about we are talking about uh, his role, his his keynote, if you will, in a program next week uh, in the Capitol in the Capitol Auditorium, which you should consider coming to, which is at one o'clock to four o'clock. One to four o'clock. Okay, on, on the tenth. At the Capitol Auditorium. Capitol Auditorium, and it's entitled um, "Making Plans." Good plans. Making good plans for a sustainable and um, resilient. resilient Hawaii. Okay. And Chip's one of the keynotes. And we're talking today about his, his special slice of that because he deals, he deals in a lot of things, but one of the ones that we're real interested in is, in, is cataclysmic things. <laughs> How do you sleep at night? <laughs> and because we should be not only worried about it, but taking affirmative action. You know, and, and since uh, you and I spoke last, uh, they, they didn't have those commissions dealing with uh, sustainability, resilience, yep. and protection. Now they do, and you sit on two of them, no. uh, one of them. There's only one that's been created. It's a state one. It's the state of Hawaii. Um, the city and county is going to be uh, creating a climate commission um, in, sometime in the very near future. Yeah, okay. And so, I mean, I hope, I hope that works to have one at the city and one at the state. Sometimes we see them go in silos, you know. It'll be interesting to see how, mm -hmm. they, how they work together. Hopefully they yeah. align. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, so the, 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 the question of this segment of the show is uh, what have we done, at least since we spoke last, um, what are we doing? What can we do to really make this happen? You know, for example, small thing, but in the Iniki case, a lot of roofs flew off because they didn't have those hurricane clips. Hurricane clips. Yeah. Are hurricane clips a matter of code now? I, I kind of wonder about that. It's a good question. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I, I mean, don't know. Little things like that. If people don't think about it, they don't do anything about it. They put it off. They say it never happened here, but it will happen here. So what has happened? And um, what is the process by which things can happen? So um, the Rockefeller Foundation has created a 100 Most Resilient Cities program around the world, and Honolulu is one of the 100 Most Resilient Cities. Um, they have had a couple of workshops here in Hawaii, and they developed some terminology that I find very useful, shocks and stressors. Shocks are that uh, 
you know, high energy events such as a hurricane or a tsunami, a stressor is sort of a chronic mm. um, background uh, stressor that can wear away at a community. Like homelessness. Homelessness mm -hmm. uh, and sea level rise. Getting back mm -hmm. to your question, mm -hmm. um, the Hawaii State Climate Commission has just uh, issued a sea level rise report, which was three years in the making um, under the uh, direction of Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Office of Planning. And this sea level rise report uh, identifies the impacts uh, of sea level rise under six inches of sea level rise, one, two, and three feet of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And um, they are proposing a new planning uh, zone called the sea level rise extreme exposure area. Uh, everything that the models indicate will be exposed to sea level rise impacts um, under up to 3.2 feet of sea level rise are being proposed as a new planning zone. And within this planning zone, um, the state legislature and the local counties have the opportunity to develop uh, new policies in reaction to um, hmm. the science that suggests there are going to be negative impacts there. Hmm. Well. So, um, so, so you know what has been done. This report has come out. There have been solid proposals, and now it's up to the uh, constituents, the elected representatives, to do something with these. So, what kind of recommendations are, have you have you looked at the report in depth to to know what kind of rep recommendations? If I'm, you know, I have a building there, am I to take it down? Am I to do X, Y, or Z to well, it? Well, the report is it that detailed in terms of recommendations. The report doesn't get into uh, "Thou shalt do mm -hmm. this." The report sort of provides recommendations at the 10,000 foot level, which I think is very smart of the report because it allows for flexibility and discussion uh, in the dis different constituencies uh, for, again, place-based decision-making and mm -hmm. place-based uh, policy mm -hmm. development. There are, there are a myriad of things that one could do. You could, um, you could elevate the homes. You could uh, talk about moving the roads. Uh, you could talk about the impact of sea level, excuse me, of, of sea walls on certain beaches that you want to keep. You could approach it from a triage point of view and say, you know, that beach is extremely important. It's more important than the road or the homes that are next to it, whereas this other beach is uh, already heavily damaged by sea walls and, the, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Uh, let's not worry about that beach. Mm. Um, and uh, other types of steps to build a resilient community, knowing that these are the exposures, the vulnerabilities that they have. Who, who, who makes those decisions? The commissions or the city council or the state legislature? Who makes those decisions? I think the commissions are going to be uh, providing recommendations and it will be up to the uh, city councils and the state legislature. The recommendations are affirmative steps though. Yes. Build a seawall, this location. That, that's what yeah, yeah there will be solid recommendations. Well, the recommendations in the report are, um, so again, they're at about 10,000 feet, and there is more detail that needs to be added to that. Yeah, but the commission would do that. That would be the next But they, but they, cr they create layer a zone. That's not, that's not necessarily uh, Who else? laid out. That, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm asking because It'd be up I... To, for instance, if you have the county of Maui, I think that a combination of the planning department and the mayor's office at the county of Maui working with the city council, with the county council, would come up with the specifics um, that, would, that would, you know, work with the data that's in the sea level rise report, but it'd be very specific to Maui. Okay, so, so somebody would decide within, say, county government, um, and then it would be passed by the county council because mm -hmm. they'll cost and money they, it costs right. money you have to find the money and, the, and the, if you have a lot of seawalls that's a lot of money mm -hmm. lots and lots of money mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess it has to there's going to have to be public input and discussion because some of the sure, seawalls will be policy right outside process. Yeah. House. Yeah. D democratic process transparency yep. whatnot yeah. um, and then and then find the money get a contractor to it and I, I, I doubt you could do it all at the same time you one by one or s segment by segment and it makes me think that this, this would used to be different if we were in China with Xi Jinping mm -hmm. uh, or in New York in the 1930s with Robert Moses. It would happen virtually overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, our, in our beautiful democracy, yeah. 
it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Do we have enough time? Yeah, government is messy in a democracy. A democracy is messy. Yeah, yeah. But at well, least so, everybody gets to express their point of view. I so Chip, getting back to the report because it's the most recent and substantive piece of work on what the impacts are and the, the red zone, so to speak. And, and if you're in that red zone, does, it, does the report say, you know, you're required to vacate or you're required no, to nothing? No, it no. just says these are the dangerous spots. Yeah, it identifies mm -hmm. the danger zones and um, when they become dangerous under one, two, and three feet of sea level rise. Um, when will sea level reach one, two, and three feet? That is shifting science. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, in, in doing the modeling for this report, uh, my research team adopted the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, United Nations report that came out in 2014, uh, estimates of when you'd hit one, two, and three feet of sea level rise. But since then, we've learned more about the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet, and there are estimates that three feet of sea level rise uh, originally thought to be a worst case scenario at the end of the century, uh, now might just be an intermediate scenario. Mm. Um, wow. So, you know, planners and communities need to uh, be aware that the science surrounding these problems, hurricanes, sea level rise, what have you, uh, is also changing and, and build that into how they develop policies. It also occurs to me that some of these zones that would be developed um, as a result of the report would be zones of private property, not necessarily all government property. And Correct. If you have private property, then you have to deal with the owner of that property. Yeah, and you may have to mm -hmm. condemn the property or mm -hmm. somehow get the guy to buy into mm -hmm. the program. Mm -hmm. Not everybody will. They'll feel that it, it you know, depreciates the value of the property, what have you. They mm -hmm. may not believe that this is necessary and so forth. And there could be litigation about this, mm -hmm. which also takes time. Mm -hmm. That's already playing out. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in addition to the counties, there is the state, and the state is responsible for the beach. Mm -hmm. And the attorney general mm -hmm. just came out with a decision that as the shoreline, which is a, a legally defined term, as the shoreline moves landward due to erosion and sea level rise, the land reverts from whatever ownership it previ previously had to state ownership, conservation lands. And so uh, mm -hmm. that piece of property comes under a whole new set of rules. And we see this playing out today on Sunset Beach on the North Shore of Oahu, uh, where you have mm -hmm. homes that are literally being undermined by the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a very vigorous debate as to, is this a temporary thing? Is this uh, sea level rise? Um, what, you know, should you be allowed to build a seawall to protect your home? If you are, will that seawall damage the beach? Um, is this beach too important to allow seawall construction? What do we do with these homeowners that are, that are in a world mm -hmm. of hurt? Do you, do you bail them out with willing seller programs, with uh, you know, public funds that would buy the land, basically expanding beach parks mm. or putting in new beach parks? Is it, is it right to use public money to, to uh, private buy yeah. private property mm. from people who you know, mm. knew they were living on the edge oh. of the ocean? Mm. Controversy. But, the, mm. Yeah, and, and sea level rise has is, is not yet reached that you know, severe upward rate of rise that we're going to be seeing in the next couple of it decades. It seems that policy should come out of these kinds of examples, yeah, so that when it yeah. does hit, you have right. something in place already. Right. Well, this really tests the wisdom of, and, and the cohesiveness of the community in general to survive. These mm -hmm. are survival issues. And if we can't come to some sort of agreement, we're going to have, we're going to have chaos on our hands, yeah. chaos mm -hmm. on the shorelines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. which leads to chaos in the streets, actually, mm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. So um, we only have a few minutes left, and I wanted to pursue your thoughts, because you, you know, you, you've come out as the guy who, uh, who wrote, who wrote the, uh, the charts about how we're going to be inundated. You've been studying mm -hmm. this for, it must be 10, 20 years already. I hear More, I get yeah. older than right. you are. Yeah. But, um, and you've been giving talks. You've been you know, talking to government agencies and the public through the media for a long, as long as I can remember, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and here we are, and we still do not have, in my view, a level of public awareness that is going to be meaningful, you know, as we get closer to the crunch. We're getting closer to the crunch. So I'd be really interested in your advice about what we should do. There is nothing more important at this stage than public service announcements. I wrote a piece on this uh, for Civil Beat last year. Uh, radio, TV, Internet of various types. 
uh, we need to be educating the public about what climate change means in Hawaii. Um, sea level rise, how El Nino brings, uh, strong El Ninos bring certain negative impacts to bear. Um, the rising air temperature, the damage that's being caused to marine ecosystems. Um, we have over 100 years of declining rainfall. We're going to have some areas where there will be more rain in the future and other areas where there will be less rain. Um, the the uh, public needs to um, gain comfort in thinking about climate change so that they can begin assimilating uh, the need for new policies and commenting on these policies and thinking to themselves how uh, in the life that I lead and in my, um, in my uh, work life um, am I going to build in you know, the need to become more resilient to climate change. If you had a public service announcement and, and you were speaking to the people, what would be the first ground zero thing that you would tell people about climate change and what they need to know? Yeah. Climate change is real, uh, it's dangerous, and I would, I would, in the space of a minute, show them the peer-reviewed science, how it goes back over 120 years to physicists and chemists in the 19th century, um, the whole history of understanding uh, the anthropogenic greenhouse effect and the, the role that carbon dioxide plays. I know right there I probably got too sciencey, but it can be laid out in very simple terms so that everybody can have confidence that um, this is, a sol this is as solid science as anything you can think of. It's a fine line, though, because you want them to have comfort in the knowledge, confidence in their ability to do something about it. Uh, you want to move them to action intelligently. Um, but you don't want it to panic. Uh, because what does panic mean in this context? It means getting on a plane, selling your house, yeah, getting out of town, just leave. mm -hmm. yeah, leaving. Leave and, and, and if a lot of people do that, it's not good. Um, so the question is, you know, how far can you go? This is really a sociological question. Mm -hmm. How far can you go before you, you hit the panic button? That's why um, public education, right? Once they become educated, you avoid the panic because you're knowledgeable. And coming with the knowledge uh, is the understanding that we can still uh, respond to this problem. We can still build a healthy, vibrant future Hawaii. But we need to get going. Mm. Yes, in we more ways than one, we're That's out of time, good. too. <laughs> <laughs> but well, looking forward to your remarks next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It'll be very important. And yeah. looking forward to see you come back here on Think Tech yeah. and talk more Anytime. about this. Yeah. We're, Anytime. We're media. We love to, you know, make people informed uh, and raise their awareness. When the commission yeah. has, you know, something that they're doing, uh -huh. we would really like to know that. And we would like to educate the public. So maybe the PSAs is not... Hard to do. We could do it. Yeah. We, we have weekly shows. Yeah. He has many other shows. Let's do them right here. Yes, you could do yeah. them right here. Yeah. yeah, and then put those videos out everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chip. Yeah, thank Chip you. Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of SOAS, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology, which Manoa. So enjoyed having you on. Thank you very much, thank both you. of you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Aloha. Yeah. Happy Aloha. New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> it's good.